Welcome back. Today we will focus on how mini Tesla plasma speaker works and then we will see how to assemble the electronic kit purchased from Banggood. Let's start. First, let's analyze the circuit. It is divided into two parts. The lower part is a Tesla generator. The upper part has the roller varying the current in the primary coil of the Tesla transformer. In the circuit, the primary coil is labeled L1 and the secondary coil L2. As for the Tesla generator, when the power is turned on, a current flows through the resistor R4 in the base of the transistor Q2. This semiconductor starts to conduct and the result is that a very high current flows through the few windings of the primary coil. The strong magnetic field around this coil generates a high voltage in the secondary coil. The lower connection of the secondary coil is at the base of the transistor. The feedback loop is closed by the parasitic capacitance of the secondary coil. A negative voltage is induced at the base. The transistor will block the current and the loss of current in the primary winding will generate another secondary high voltage, now of opposite polarity. The negative voltage that had ended up on the base via CRS is now discharging rapidly. The transistor is driven back into conduction and the cycle repeats. The circuit will oscillate at fairly high frequency. As for the audio generator part, a MOSFET Q1 is connected between the 24 volt power supply and the circuit. This semiconductor is configured with two resistors, R3 and R1, for a certain quiescent current large enough to make the Tesla oscillator work. However, it is possible to vary the gate voltage by modulating an audio signal on it. As a result, the conductivity and thus internal resistance of the MOSFET will vary as will the current available to power the primary coil of the Tesla transformer. In this way, the sparks generated can dance to the rhythm of the music. In case we don't want this effect, we can short circuit the source and the drain. Now we will see how to assemble the whole circuit. The package consists of to 10 kilo ohms resistors R1 and R4, to 2 kilo ohms resistors R3 and R5, a 1 microfarad electrolytic capacitor C1 and a 1 microfarad capacitor C2, IRF 530 and power MOSFET Q1, TIP41 NPN BJT Q2, two red LEDs, one red wire for coil and one, a 327 microhenry 350 tons coil L2, a power socket 5 by 2.1 mm J1, a 3.5 mm audio socket J2, six bolts M3 by six, 4x nuts M3 by 10, 2 heat sinks 25 by 23, a neon light bulb for test, and finally a 75 by 40 mm PCB. Initially, I started with resistors. They are identified by the color code. R1 and R4 have the colors in the following order, brown, black, black, red and brown. 
If you are not sure what the value of a resistor is, you can use a multimeter to check it. In this case, a value of about 10 kOhms can be observed, while R3 and R5 have the following color code red, black, black, brown, brown. Using the multimeter, a value of about 2 kOhms can be observed. Then I proceed with the soldering of R1, R3, R4, R5 on the PCB. This step is very simple. You have to follow the text on the board to know where to put the resistance. Furthermore, before applying the tin, to prevent the resistance from coming out of the holes, I widen the pins. Finally, I cut the extra part of the pins with scissors. I did the same for the electrolytic capacitor. The only difference is to put the side with the grey band, which indicates the negative pole, where the white semicircle is located. As for the other capacitor, being a ceramic capacitor, there are no differences in its orientation. For both capacitors, their value is written on them. I then soldered the LEDs. To know how to solder an LED, you need to look at the length of its pins. The longer the anode, positive pole, the shorter the cathode, negative pole. When in doubt, you can rely on a multimeter in diode mode. On the PCB, the square pad identifies the anode. As with the other components, the pins of the LEDs are also widened to adjust their height. Next, it was the turn of the audio jack. Before soldering, to prevent the component from falling out, I put some scissors under it. After partially fixing the audio jack, I removed the scissors and completed the soldering. As for the power socket, however, I did not need any support. I simply soldered it by placing it on the table and applying the tin. About the transistors for the TIP41, first I put some glue on one of the heat sinks and attached it to the PCB. Then I inserted the BJT and anchored it to the heat sink with a screw. In the end I soldered it. Instead, for the IRF530, before soldering it, I first anchored the MOSFET to the heat sink and then I put the glue on it. The difference is due to the fact that there was no space to screw the MOSFET once the heat sink was glued. As uh, with the other components, I shortened the transistor pins with scissors. As a last step, I mounted the two coils. The secondary coil is the 350 turns one. Be careful! There is an arrow on it that indicates in which direction the coil is wound. The primary coil must be wound in the opposite direction to the secondary one. So, I glued the secondary coil to the PCB and scraped the end of the copper wire and soldered it into the L2 pad. According to the arrow, I wound the red wire clockwise starting from pad L1. Since the red wire is short, I added another wire. I cut off the excess wire and soldered the end into the square pad near the LEDs and capacitor C2. In the end, I added the PCB supports by screwing the X nuts to the four corners of the board. Now the whole circuit is completed. I powered it at 24 volts. As you can see, 
Bringing the neon bulb closer to the coils increases its brightness. Instead, using a metal object, such as an aluminum sphere, we can observe a small spark. By giving an input audio, the sparks begin to produce sound. The audio you are listening to was recorded with the microphone you see in the video and comes from the sparks. After checking the basic operation of the device, I proceeded with a technical analysis. Using the oscilloscope, we can observe how the signal intensity varies when a conductive object is approached to the coil. Also, we can find the frequency at which the circuit oscillates. From this data, we can calculate the parasitic capacitance of the secondary coil. Knowing that the inductance of the coil is about 830 microarray and that the frequency is equal to 7.35 MHz and 1 over 2 pi square root of Lc, with the inverse formula we derive the parasitic capacitance. After all calculation, we can find that the parasitic capacitance is equal to 0.56 picofarad. Thanks for watching. Activate the bell for new videos and subscribe to the channel. See you next time.